I'm an English and philosophy teacher at Montrose High School, and it's with pleasure that I'm the head of the chair for this particular session on formation renewal through secondary education, since it's such a crucial aspect of a time in a person's life. So we have three panelists this morning, and they're all either presidents or heads of schools, and they'll be speaking to us about really the story of their schools. So we're going to run this session where each one will present sort of their story in about 15 minutes, and then we'll wait until the end, until everyone is finished, to take questions and answers, and then they can be directed to anyone, either, any of the three. So I think we're going to start with Rich, let's see, Rich Clark, who is now the new principal of St. Martin, president, he was principal of another school, of St. Martin de Porres School, which is based on or modeled after Cristo Rey High School in Chicago. And you said there are how many? There's five now, and there'll be 11 next year. Yeah, so it's a huge inner city school system for giving college prep education to inner city students, so it's a wonderful thing. And he was before, for 12 years, principal of St. Ignatius High School in Cleveland, Ohio. So he's going to speak to us about this new venture, right, the new school that he's the president of now. Let us welcome Richard Clark. Great. Thank you. I'm a failed theology teacher, really, so I can speak to a class that's going to be pretty nicely. First of all, I'm very happy to be here, and I'm happy you're here. I was telling somebody else up here that the first one I went to, one of these things yesterday, a panel discussion, there were three people in the audience, so I said, okay, this is better than that. So thank you for coming. I'm going to tell you very briefly about the Cristo Rey Network and the Cristo Rey idea, and then a little bit about our school in Cleveland. Because I think it's a movement that's beginning in this country that I'm just very happy to be a part of. The presentation I went to yesterday morning was about a thing in Dallas called Project Access. And it was about providing health care to people who are uninsured. That's a huge problem in the United States, obviously. Well, what's another huge problem in the United States is quality education for the poor. And particularly in a Catholic setting. Just very hard to do because of the cost. About eight years ago, nine years ago, the provincial of the Chicago province of Jesuits talked to Cardinal Bernadine of Chicago, Cardinal George's predecessor, about more involvement with the Latino community in Chicago. And Cardinal Bernadine suggested that they take over a parish in a Mexican neighborhood, which they did, and find out what the needs are. Well, they quickly found out that the needs were clearly education, and in particular, secondary education. So the Jesuits were committed to starting a secondary Jesuit school in a Mexican neighborhood in Chicago, Tulsa Little Village. One detail, of course, is how do you pay for that? Loyal Academy, which is a Jesuit high school outside of Chicago in the Met, where I taught for 20 years. I think the tuition there is close to $9,000. St. Ignatius College Prep in Chicago, another Jesuit school, probably $9,100. They're always a little bit more than Loyal Academy. Anyway, so how do you do that? Well, a fantastic idea came about, and that's really the kernel that started this movement. The idea was to have students work at real jobs during school time to earn their tuition, so to speak. And what they did is they formed a non-for-profit job agency. And they went out to law firms. Let's take a specific example. Went to a law firm. Said, you're paying somebody in your happy room $26,000, $27,000 a year. That's with benefits, like unemployment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Why don't you give that job to us? Why don't you outsource that job to the Cristo Rey Employment Agency? And we'll provide you with a team of four energetic young kids who will show up every day, which is a big plus in the temporary agency, and who will be accountable and will watch them, will supervise them. We'll get them there. We'll pick them up at the end of the day. Well, they went out and they got jobs. It was very easy because businesses want to help. They don't necessarily want to write you a check for $25,000. But they're already paying $28,000, $29,000 for these jobs. So here's an opportunity to pay only $25,000 and look like a hero. 
So it was immediately a big success, and they got all the jacks. Then, of course, they didn't get the kids. So they got the kids. And then, as Father John Foley, who was the founder of that school, said they sent them out uh, on that first day, and he kind of hid under the desk, <laughs> hoping that they'd come back. Uh, and indeed, they did come back. Um, and it was a, a rousing success. And that pay, that JAP program, pays for about 70% of the operating costs of the school. Therefore, tuition at Cristo Ray in Chicago is 2200 and 40% of the kids get financial aid on top of that. So it becomes a possibility uh, for these kids, 500 of them now at that school, it's eight years old now, uh, to do this. So really it's fine. I've been John Foley for a long time, uh, since uh, the, the 70s. I visited the school. I was principal of St. Ignatius uh, uh, High School in, in Cleveland. And uh, I would come and visit, and it was great, and everything was fine. Uh, and then one day, he needed to build a gym. So he needed to raise a lot of money. And somehow he met a new a guy in California named B.J. Cassie, who came to the school and got the tour, got the story, just like I'm giving you, fell in love with the place, but then said to John, well, I got good news, and I got bad news. <laughs> What's the bad news? I'm not going to build you a gym. Oh, I'm tired. What's the good news? I want to start a foundation that will promote a network of these schools in every major United States city, run by the Jesuits. Well, John Foley immediately said, well, the Jesuits can't run that. It's not enough Jesuits. Uh, but that's great. Let's talk about it. The next day, Mr. Cassin called up and said, I'm going to put $22 million of my own money, my wife and I, into that foundation, and I'm going to hire your development director to run it. And that's how it started. And that was about three and a half years ago. Now, just three years later, Denver, Los Angeles and Watts, Portland, Oregon, Austin, Texas, and Chicago, all are in existence as a Cristo Race School. Uh, next year, when we actually start with kids, we'll have Cleveland, we'll have Cleveland, Illinois, uh, two outside of Boston, North Cambridge and Lawrence, New York, um, and Tucson will come online. So in just three years, 11 of these schools have happened. So it's a fantastic movement. And as I like to tell people, it's an exclusive school. If you can afford it, you can't come. And that's a, to me, that's a very gossiping bag. <laughs> uh, it, it's like the people in the vineyard, you know, the ones that worked all day and the ones that worked one hour, they all get the same money. Well, the same thing going on here. It's a reversal. It's a, it, it, some people don't like that. They want to be a part of it. Sorry, you can't. Because a major problem in the United States is a lack of education. In our six surrounding neighborhoods, the median income is $16,000. 48% of the adults have a high school education. That's it. All right. So if you wonder why that part of the city is poor, that's a pretty good answer because of the lack of education. Now what happened in Cleveland? Well, I got picked by the buck. I actually, we were trying to figure out how to do this network, um, and John Foley knew of a network of schools in Peru, believe it or not, called Fe Alegria, Faith and Happiness. We went down to visit Fe Alegria, uh, at headquarters in Lima, we visited a school which was in the absolute worst part of Lima. Uh, you walked into that school and it was a beautiful, looked like the, the great school my kids went to. Catholic school, they were all in line. There was a nun from Philadelphia speaking Spanish with a Philadelphia accent, if you can imagine. That. Uh, and, and it was just fantastic. It was a miracle. And I said to myself then and there, if they could do that in Peru, in Lima, we can do it in Cleveland. And so, we brought together some people. I made talks just like I'm doing right now. And people said, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do it. Uh, we worked with the diocese over three years so we wouldn't step on any feet uh, and make sure that we're not taking kids from other schools, which was a big concern. I was originally in Chicago. It turned out, obviously, they're not, but that was a big concern. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, as we began, uh, we found this parish in um, East Side of Cleveland called St. Vitus, an old Slovenian parish. Uh, and their school was in Gastrochek, their grade school. It's a beautiful three-story brick building, well-kept, two brand-new boilers, new windows, everything else, but the tuition just was unaffordable for the people in the area. They just could not keep supporting the school. They were spending $200,000 a year, losing $200,000 a year for 10 years. This parish, and the parish, you can imagine, an inner-city parish doesn't exactly have that much money to lose. So they had to close the school. The pastor read about this in the newspaper, invited us to come there, and said, why don't you, why don't you sit up here? 
we want a school. It's going to be a high school. It'll be a great school, but we'll, we'll take it. Uh, and so I, I, I took that as a, as a great sign that this can be done. I mean, there are people in cities all across the United States that want to do this. Okay? And interestingly enough, as I heard the Project Access people talk yesterday about the Dallas Project, where they had really, they've been doing this for a long time, several years, and they had the academic underpinnings and, you know, metastructures and uh, all sorts of interesting and great ideas, which I'm going to follow up on. We are in a situation where we're, we're absolutely brand new. Uh, we know it's right. It's predominantly, it's, it's focal point is Jesus Christ. I mean, we're, we're doing this out of a response from the gospel. Um, and not in an evangelical way, but we're, we're just individuals involved in this project really believe this is what Jesus is calling us to do. If you look at the Catholic Church and history of the Catholic Church, they've always, we've always come to a, a situation where what's the big problem? Maybe it was health care. Years ago, it was health care. So, started Catholic hospitals. Uh, education of the poor and immigrants started schools. Uh, well, what, what are the big problems now? Well, it's still education of the poor. How do we pay for it is the bigger problem. Health certainly is, and that's why I thought this project access was a fantastic idea, which is, I think, replicatable throughout the United States to provide quality health care for people who can't afford it. Uh, so the Catholic Church is called to do this at all times. We are always called. Uh, to look at what the big needs are in society, what what are the big issues, uh, and then try to do something about it. And of course, from my own personal standpoint, I, I taught for 30 years in a Jesuit high school one way or another. Uh, that's all I do. Uh, don't hold that against me, but that's all I do. Uh, and, and, uh, and I sat in meetings where good kids, kids that we really wanted to come to our school couldn't come because they couldn't afford it. And I, I mean, I said, as principal, I sat in those meetings for 12 years. I felt like I was I was throwing kids into the North Atlantic. You know, you can come on the light boat, you can't. It, it was very hard to do. I mean, anybody who's in that position now knows how hard that is. Uh, this makes the light boat bigger. Still just the light boat, though. It's not, it's not the total solution. That's how I want to end. As I think... The Catholic Church has to begin to design all sorts of models for education. Loyal Academy should still exist. St. Ignatius should still, still exist. Obviously, the two schools we're going to hear about should still exist. But we need other models. We need other ways to approach this huge, huge problem. When 20 to 25 percent of the United States adult population is functionally illiterate, we got a big problem. All right. So, uh, my my closing though. Because I know some people ask this question. You know, the kids you're working with aren't really can't. And, and my answer to that is, well, you know, there's a, a thing right across the street from St. Ignatius High School called Westside Catholic Center, which is a food and clothing place. Now, the people they serve are very neat. They need clothes, they need food every day, they're, they're hungry, they're unemployed, etc. They don't line up and say, are you can't? They say, you have a need. Um, Hospitals, the same way, don't go to a Catholic hospital and say, sir, we can't treat you, you're, you're a Lutheran. Uh, no, you're in need, you're sick. Okay, and likewise, these kids are in need. So it's a Catholic school primarily because we're Catholic. That's what we are called to do, to help these people, whatever they are, to help them because they are in need. That's the bottom line. So, Enough for me. I think I did 15 minutes. Okay. And, and uh, we're going to do our stories, and then we'll have questions afterwards. And, of course, I have plenty of materials if you want to take these back to your cities and begin this project in your city because it can be funded. The money is there. Don't lay on money. If you want to do this, it can be done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we'll hear from Dr. Kohler, who... Received his PhD in philosophy from the University of Notre Dame, taught here on the philosophy faculty from 1967 to 69, and then at the University of San Francisco from 1969 to 75. He's the founder of Trinity Schools and has served as the head of each of their three schools. Since 1986, he's been president of Trinity Schools and in that capacity directs the work of each of the three campuses. His wife also um, teaches at the Trinity Schools and has served, serves as the dean of girls and presently director of admissions. So he's going to now tell us about the training schools.
Just a, a slight correction, I'm, I'm a founder of Trinity Schools. It was founded by a whole bunch of folks. What I'd like to do is tell you a kind of narrative account about the founding of the schools and in that try to hit all the things which I think are distinctive about what we're doing. And there's a lot more we can talk about, obviously, in the, in the discussion period. Um, we have three schools. We have a school here in South Bend. We, we teach kids in seventh grade through twelfth grade. We have a school here in South Bend that was founded in 1981. It has 277 students. We have a school in Bloomington, Minnesota that was started in 1986. We've got 400 students there. We have a new school that we just opened four years ago in Falls Church, Virginia. Uh, it's about 100 and 110 students at this time. Uh, the schools are uh, an outreach of the People of Praise community, which is an ecumenical Christian community of about 2,000 members. Uh, when we started the schools in 1981, the People of Praise community existed only here in town. Now uh, we have branches throughout the United States and in Canada and the Caribbean. The, uh, so that's kind of an interesting story given the, uh, the conference theme about communities and the, the Jesuits and Opus Dei and people reaching out and doing education. The, uh, as I mentioned, the People of Praise community is an ecumenical community. That's just a, a school is an ecumenical school. Uh, most of uh, the members of the People of Praise happen to be Roman Catholic, and most of the students that we get uh, at each of our schools, about 85, 90 percent of our students come from uh, are from Catholic homes. The school started, and the whole idea started as a conversation among parents. Um, we were parents here in South Bend. We were members of the People of Praise. We were uh, we had children. Uh, about in, in our case, it was our oldest daughter was about to go into high school. Uh, most of us in this conversation had been involved in collegiate education. Virtually none of the founders came up through the way of kind of primary secondary education or usual kind of education, uh, primary and secondary education uh, route. Uh, all of us came from from the collegiate side, and we had seen as teachers at universities and colleges uh, a lot of the mistakes that had been made in high school education in the students we were not trying to teach. And we were, we were somewhat dismayed by what we found. We were also concerned with what the Nation at Risk report uh, uh, called the rising tide of mediocrity in education, which we thought was uh, an apt description. We were also concerned uh, about what was going on then in school cultures, uh, in the parochial schools in particular. Uh, but this was true throughout uh, education in America. A lot of the things were starting then that we now just simply have to accept a kind of uh, coarsening of the culture, the increase of immorality in the culture, uh, the kind of increasing vulgarity in the culture. And uh, it was not something that we looked forward to as parents uh, putting our own children in. Um, and so all of those considerations went into this conversation. So we started talking. We said, gee, could, maybe we could do a school. And uh, we you know, formed the committee. And we got some people, gave us some money. And we got people in and did some consulting with people. And we, we, we worked at this for a couple of years. And uh, in 1981, we decided to just go ahead and do it. Now, the People of Praise community, uh, most of us who are in this discussion also happen to be leaders in the People of Praise. And so the people, this was a conversation in the People of Praise. And so the People of Praise was willing. We did a consultation with the whole community. They were willing to basically be the financial support for this project. As anyone can tell you, uh, as, as Rich just mentioned, I mean, money is a very big factor in this. And if you're in this business long and you travel and meet people, one of the things you find is all kinds of people across America who have great ideas for schools, some who have founded really good schools, but the, a lot of them have ceased existing after three, four, or five years because they simply run out of money. So the support of the People of Praise community uh, was essential. The financial support was essential to launching the schools. When we, when we started this, when we, started, we were completing this conversation and getting ready to open the schools, uh, we, we started to ask ourselves, so what exactly are we going to be about? And what we, what we chose as our objective or as our goal, and it continues to be our objective, was one very simple thing. And it was the only thing we were going to do, and that is to educate kids. Uh, and by that, we meant something fairly narrow. We meant we were going to deal with their intellect, with their mind, and with the, their aesthetic sensibilities. We were not going to do counseling. We were not going to evangelize kids as Christians. We were not concerned about their life in Christ directly. We were going to educate. We thought if we, if we kept the goal really narrow, we might have a chance of succeeding. We were not going to do nutrition workshops. We were going to do AIDS awareness weeks. We were not going to do any of that. We were, no, like I said, no personal counseling, no pastoral counseling. We were going to try to do school and do the best job we could. 
That goal has, to, has been very, very useful to us, and we still use it when, when we look at all kinds of other interesting possibilities that come to the fore in our discussion as our schools grow. We ask ourselves, will this option advance that goal or not? And what are we willing to give up in terms of what we're doing to advance that goal? So mm -hmm. keeping that goal clear, clearly in mind, it helps us from everything from recruiting faculty to uh, managing uh, the uh, curriculum. The next thing that was important to us was the realization that what we wanted to do wasn't so much school after all. What we wanted to do was form a community of learners with these, student, with these children. As I said, we wanted, to be a, we wanted a community of learners, uh, of, of, of young, young men and women and uh, the faculty who would, who would engage themselves together in learning everything they could about what they were studying and what was interesting to them and what was worth learning. And uh, we, did, we did not want to have something that we ended, up, we ended up having a school and you end up having grades, you end up having bells that ring and you have a lunch hour and you do all of that sort of thing, keep transcripts and records. That's all kind of, you just have to do that to exist. But we, we were not trying to do school. Maritain has a wonderful, a wonderful uh, comment where he says, education is not animal training, it's a human awakening. And that's what we wanted to enact, was a human awakening in our students. We weren't about grades, we're still not about grades, we don't care less about grades. We report grades, you have to have grades, they go out. We use it, we call it uh, a currency exchange. Uh, you, have to, you, have to, you have to exchange with the universities and when kids transfer, so you need grades to do that. What we're interested in knowing is what this student knows and doesn't know. And so our, our, we work with, with each student very, very carefully all through the year and are giving them, in fact, we have a rule in the school that no teacher can put a grade, a letter grade, on any piece of student work. What you put are comments. Uh, you did this well, I think you need to work on comments there. I think that, I think you made, you got uh, your uh, subject predicate, uh, you're confused about how that works. This argument doesn't make sense, this argument is terrific. Uh, we want the students to encounter that kind of evaluation and be part of that kind of conversation rather than saying, oh, I got a B minus, that's what I expected, and go off to the next class. So forming a community of learners is, is essential to understanding what we're about in the culture of the school, uh, the culture of, the, of our schools. Um, another part of that is we decided not to have a standalone administration. Uh, we were going to have the school run by teachers, and so the head of school teaches, the deans teach, uh, and we hire administrative assistants to kind of get that work done. But we did not want a school run by administrative concerns. We wanted a school run by the community of learners, by teacherly concerns and student concerns. And that's been very important to us. And it's, it, it works into our, into our life in, in a lot of different ways. Uh, it's not just a slogan. Uh, one of the things we do, for example, in all of our schools is we keep all our faculty together in one room. Uh, they're not squirreled away in little cubicles throughout the building because we want, a, we want a conversation. We want some communication between them. This is what we're about. We're about communication, conversation, reading, thinking. That's, and that's what we're about as faculty, and that's the, that's the culture we're trying to bring our students into. We, and, they, and as they grow through the program, uh, they become members of that community of learners, and they're sitting at the table with us in that conversation as equals, and they're really good at it. So then the question occur occurred, what, what ought we to teach? And uh, so what, what ought we to be concerned with? And we asked ourselves a simple question, and that was, what ought every educated adult know? So I said, well, you ought to know some history and some literature, the grammar of your own language. You ought to be conversant in math and science. You ought to know something about the arts. And as we just added that at all, we thought, that looks like a curriculum. We could probably do something with that for, uh, you know, we've got these students for six years. So in fact, that's what we did. We adopted a core curriculum. Everybody takes exactly the same thing. The only electives in our program uh, are uh, junior and senior students who elect which modern language they want. That's after four years of Latin. Or uh, they also have a math, science, or humanities colloquium choice in their senior year. And so our students do six years of math. They start with... Uh, Pre-algebra, algebra, geometry, pre-calculus, calculus, and they end with uh, group theory. They do uh, six years of science, life science, earth science, uh, biology, physics one, chemistry, physics two. Um, they do four years of music, uh, four years of art and painting, two years of drama, uh, six years of religion, uh, etc. Okay, so you get the picture. I can give you a lot more detail. Uh, if you'd like to know, but that will give you an idea of what we're doing. Another key 
observation for us at this, at this point was that the student is the agent, the main agent of his or her education. You can have PowerPoint presentations, you can have all of this whiz-bang technology, you can stand up here and you can have 55 PhDs, and if you're talking away and the student isn't thinking, isn't engaged, nothing is happening. I mean, it's zero. It looks good, there's all kinds of fancy stuff happening, but nothing is happening. So how, we wanted to ask ourselves, how can we keep the student engaged? That's where the action is, is with the student and among the students. So we, we thought one of the things we have to do is have small classes. So we uh, limit our classes to 18 students each. We, have, uh, we will go as high as 20, but you have to get a lot of permissions to go that high. It should be a really unusual situation. But 18 is our, is our max in uh, students. Because a small class means that students obviously can't, can't hang out at the margins. They can't escape being noticed and dealt with. Uh, faculty uh, have an opportunity to know each one of them, uh, know where they're at, work with them in the classroom setting. Uh, we have another, and we can talk about this in the Q&A, I'll just mention it now because it's a big topic. We decided to have separate sex classes. We have co-ed schools, but uh, the classes are, for the most part, uh, the girls have classes together and the boys have classes together. That, by the way, in my experience is, and I can talk, I'll talk about it more in the discussion if you want to, because I can tell you some stories, but it is, uh, it's, it's one of the real keys to our success. And if you come to our school and you ask students, in fact, some of our graduates are here in this room, if you ask them what they thought about single set classes, most of them found them really freeing, really exactly what, what they, uh, they love. The, gir the girls typically say, you know, yeah, this is a co-ed school, and I want to have a social life, but boys in our classroom, come on, you'd be kidding me. Uh, and the same with the, the same with the boys. The, uh, the sa there's a there's a boys and girls learn differently. That's really obvious. Uh, and the second thing is that there's an, an enormous amount of gender freedom when you're together with your own your own people, to put it that way. And uh, there's there's an enormous amount of freedom and lack of distraction in the classroom. But we can we can get back to that. So we do small classes, separate sex classes. So we have. For example, a, a, seventh, a, a class for us would be 18 boys, 18 girls, okay? Section of each, that's seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, up the line. When we have a school of 400, we have two sections of boys, two sections of girls, all the way up the line. Another major part of, of the Trinity School program that has to do with keeping students engaged and thinking, uh, which is, after all, the goal, um, is that we use, wherever we can, original texts and not textbooks. And we have a big investment in seminars. Um, I'll give you one. Again, you know, we can talk about this at greater length in the, the, the Q and A or discussion period. I'll give you just a little picture of what the seminars look like. We do what's called humane letters seminars uh, in the high school. It's two hours a day, five days a week, all four years of the of the of the high school. Uh, the first year we do American history and American literature. The second year, the sophomore year, we do modern European history and modern European literature. In the junior and senior year, the uh, history component drops out, and we're just simply reading and discussing texts. And so we do the Iliad, the Odyssey, the uh, Theban plays. We do uh, the, uh, the history of the Peloponnesian War. We do Plato's Republic, about five or six Socratic dialogues, Nicomachean ethics, uh, Athanasius on the Incarnation. In the uh, senior year, we oh, we end up with the Confessions, Augustine. We do uh, in the senior year. We start with uh, a couple of essays of Augustine, move to uh, the Inferno, then some Aquinas, Luther, Calvin, Montaigne's in defense of Ramon Savon, Descartes' Meditations, Don Quixote, uh, some Hegel, uh, Rousseau's Social Contract, where this Caramel itself. I think I got them all. But that's all we do. So just read that book, and you, we don't let them read any secondary sources. You can't read the preface. You can't read the thing on the back. It's what do you think is going on. And I'm the leader of that seminar. We're there for a discussion. I'm not there as some sort of authority hiding. You know, I have, this is just a little fake seminar in which we get you to talk, and then I play the trump cards and say, well, that was it. You're, you're kind of right about that, and you're kind of right about that, and here's the real answer. No, whatever I have to say is just like what any student has to say. It's on the table. It's argued about. You have to have evidence. You have to go to the text and show us where you found that. Why would you think he means that there when he says pretty much the same thing it seemed to me three books before that, and I thought he meant something totally different. What is that about? And, and so the students are having that conversation back and forth, and we're having that conversation with them. Um, 
And that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a huge part of the Trinity experience, as you mean, two hours a day. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big part. It has a lot to do with the formation of our students and, and uh, why, they're, uh, why, they, why they're so good, actually. And so much fun to be with. As a teacher, I taught uh, in collegiate life, and I taught a lot of seminars in college life. And, I, and this is honest truth. Whenever I get a chance to teach a junior or senior seminar in our school, in any of our schools, I come out of that conversation as an adult as intellectually stimulated as I was in any collegiate seminar. I mean, these, these students are good. They can really read Plato. They can really read Aristotle. They have good questions. They can carry on a conversation. It's really exciting. I come out of that with a lot of stuff on my mind. And we as faculty are talking about a lot of that, too, and we're talking with the students. I mean, that, that's what we had in mind when we talked about community of learners. <laughs> Last thing um, I mentioned is that, again, in this whole arena of having students as the main agent, is uh, that the whole program is performance-based all throughout. So you've got the seminars where you're talking and reading. You've got, uh, we have a big writing program uh, in, the, in the high school students write essays. I don't know exactly, uh, probably every three or four weeks they're writing an essay. Um, that a, uh, you know, they've got to talk, they've got to write. In the, the arts classes are not art appreciation. In the music class you play an instrument, you sing, there's composition. Uh, in the art classes, you paint, you draw. In the drama class, you get up and do Shakespeare in public performance or the Greek tragedies or, or drama. You don't hold a sword or just do costuming. you got to get up and act and memorize lines. So that's, uh, that's what we do. Um, I, saw, I mean, I packed a lot in there, and, uh, but I'd be delighted if we could talk some more about it at the Q&A time. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, our final speaker is Dr. Karen Bolin, who's survived a harrowing experience of being left at the airport last night. Um, so we're glad that she's arrived. And she's the new head of Montrose School. She And I failed to mention in the beginning, we also have a, quite a large contingent from Montrose because our students have presented at this conference for the last three years. So um, we're very happy to have our head also here present today. She, has, she taught English and drama at Montrose from 1988 to 1994 and then secured her doctorate in moral education and served as executive director of the Center for the Advancement of Ethics and Character at Boston University and assistant professor in the School of Education. Um, Dr. Bolin is co-author with Kevin Ryan of the widely acclaimed book Building Character in Schools and her most recent book Teaching Literature Awakening the Moral Imagination will be published by, now help me with this, what's the? Rutledge Palmer this spring. She's a consultant to public and private schools across the country, a member of the National Experts Panel on Character Education in High Schools, and a member of the editorial board for the Journal of Research and Character Education. And she, like the other panelists, is going to tell us the story of Montrose. Thanks, Mary Jane. I just want to survey my audience a little bit. How many of you went to independent or private high schools? And how many of you attended public high schools? Okay, and so there's a nice mix here. And how many of you are aspiring educators or are currently teaching? Okay, and, and teaching at the secondary level, anyone? Okay, great, great. Just like to know who I'm talking to. I mean, I, I want to tell you the story of Montrose, and um, but before I do that, I, I'm coming back to the school from a, a different perspective because I've been working with students of education and, and veteran teachers from public and private schools. And I know working with a large group of undergraduates who aspire to become teachers, um, one of the main attractions was to become a teacher someplace where you can really make a difference. And um, a lot of my students who came from private schools or who came from suburban schools did not want to return to suburban schools. They wanted to teach either in a poor rural community, or they wanted to teach in an urban setting, or they wanted to do something very different, international education. Because there's this sense that if you come from suburbia and the world of you know minivans and soccer teams and soccer moms, um, you, you just aren't experiencing the real world. And if you want to make a contribution in education, you have to do something in a very different setting. And uh, you know, as a young teacher, when I went into education, I was a little bit loath to 
accept a job in a, in a private school. Um, I was eager to work in a, in a larger public school setting where I, I did have some um, background. And uh, the job market is the job market, so you wind up where you are. And I, I wound up teaching at the Montrose School. And I was struck at how um, the needs of adolescents are so similar internationally, in suburban schools, and urban schools, and rural schools. I mean, the economics might be different. The family situations might be different. But the need um, for uh, a sense of understanding oneself, the intellectual curiosity, the desire for friendship and belonging, a lot of the fundamental needs were very much the same. And the challenges of peer pressure, um, eating disorder, dealing with drugs, dealing with family trauma, depression, anxiety, um, are the same in a lot of different schools in, uh, across different socioeconomic strata. And um, having, having said that, I think what struck me as I visited schools, um, some very, very affluent prep schools, as well as some very, very poor schools and, and rural communities, is that teachers and school principals and administrators are also eager for some of the same things. They want to affect the kinds of persons their students are becoming. They really do care about the fact that they grow into mature, mature and responsible adults. They really are committed to their academic training and their success in college, university, and professional life afterwards. There's this common set of concerns. But the nature of schools as communities varies enormously. And some can be very empty places. Some can be very bureaucratically driven. Some can be wonderful communities of learners, as we've just heard described. Some can be wonderful environments where students feel mentored and supported. But a lot of times, Schools can be driven by multiple and conflicting forces, and they can lose sight of their purpose. They can lose their sense of soul. In every institution, to really form and renew the members of its community has to have a vision, has to have a sense of commitment to something worthwhile, has to be willing to say, we stand for this, and we're willing to live or die for this. And I think that's what is really important in secondary schools, a sense of identity, a sense of conviction about who we are and where we're headed. And at Montrose, which was founded only 25 years ago next year, um, similar to what Carrie was describing, was a group of parents who were very dissatisfied with the educational experience their children were having in schools and the school systems in general, at, dissatisfied with the academics, dissatisfied with the education and faith. Most of these parents were Catholic parents. They were dissatisfied with the overall attention and challenge their students, their children were receiving in schools. And so they decided to build a program that is focuses primarily on educating the whole person. And the three foundational pillars of that are close collaboration with parents, which is very unusual at a secondary school. You know, in elementary school and in middle school, parents will attend meetings more frequently and be m much more involved in their children's education. In high school, they sort of fall out of the picture a little bit. And yet, all of the studies and research show that adolescents who flourish the most, adolescents who are most able to sort of resist uh, at-risk behaviors or turn around, even if they've been engaged for a long time in activities that are detrimental to their psychological, um, intellectual, or moral health, that, that the single most compelling variable there is the influence of loving uh, parents or, in the case of students who don't always have that opportunity, an adult mentor or friend who really um, had faith in who they were. And so uh, close collaboration with parents is, sort of, is kind of singular uh, at Montrose. And um, schools, there's two or three schools, one in Washington, DC, one in, um, well, girls' schools, and two of them have brother schools, one outside of Chicago, the Willows Academy, that has similar philosophies. And so co close collaboration with parents, a rigorous liberal arts curriculum, and thirdly, um, a focus on personalized character formation. And these can sound like pretty traditional ideas, but they're, they're difficult to enact. I mean, they can just remain in words on a page. They can remain kind of. Um, 
you know, the, the slogan that you have, but to really educate the whole person, which is what I would argue high school students are, are seeking. I mean, they're, they're seeking to develop their identity. They're seeking to um, discover who they are and what life has in store for them, what God has in mind for them. And if you have teachers who are also teachers, coaches, who are also committed to being mentors and close collaborators with students and close collaborators with parents, you're really sort of increasing the number of adults in a young person's life that can help them to develop their mind, their heart and their will. Those are the three aspects of educating the whole person. And I think educating the mind is so central. It's, it's not just the context of a, a rich curriculum where learning is taken really seriously, that level of academic engagement and, and challenge. But it's that realization that you know our, our, our reason can run amok without training, without training in um, a love for and a desire to pursue the truth. Um, at, at Montrose, education and reason and faith are, definitely go hand in hand. And we do take our inspiration from John Paul II and the importance of going very deep in an intellectual understanding of science, philosophy, history, modern foreign language, but also in um, the understanding of one's faith. And inspired by the teachings of the Catholic Church, Montrose is both distinctively Catholic, but it's also authentically Catholic with a small c and welcomes students from all faith traditions, including Muslim, all Christian denominations, and Jewish students. And um, all of these students participate in you know, the, the solidarity of prayer that's evidenced at Montrose, another really singular feature as, as an independent school with a Catholic philosophy is that Mass is celebrated every day. And that's, that's really unusual in a secondary school. Um, and a lot of our students from different faith traditions attend because they like that moment of a break, of enrichment, to really spend some time in prayer and reflection. And that's part of the integral education of, of faith and reason. Um, the, the curriculum, as I mentioned, is challenging. The students study both theology and philosophy, as well as four years of English, history, language. But the second aspect that really helps educate the whole person I would say is the focus on the education of students' wills. You know, that, that point, that place of, of choice, that place of deciding how I will use my freedom. How will I grow and become a responsible adult? And um, many of the parents were inspired by the vision of St. Jose Maria, who's a modern saint, who was just canonized last year, who really loved freedom who really believed you, you cannot just download an education on a person, particularly with respect to understanding of faith, where you have to really help a person fall in love with what's worthwhile. You have to help a person want to walk in the direction of discovering the great things for their life. And so the education of will is not about ironclad rules and regulations. It's about giving each student a personal advisor who's not their, their personal college counselor or guidance counselor, checking in on their grades and their discipline and um, how they're, what, what, what school they're on track to attend. Um, the personal advisor is there to help them make sense of their social experiences at the school, their athletic experience at the school, their academics. Is That person is there to help them set goals for themselves. That person is there to help challenge them to stretch a little bit more in the context of their friendships, in the context of all of the leadership opportunities in the school. Our student government has a very um, prominent platform. I mean, they, they lead almost every assembly. They initiate almost every student group and club. Um, they are in the fore forefront of the school, representing the school. And the older students, we're 6 through 12, so the juniors and seniors mentor the middle school students um, in leadership, in character, in friendship. And there's numerous opportunities for that level of leadership and um, character development at the school. So the, the, the advisor is that adult who's more of a mentor and friend challenging each young woman to 
fulfill her potential and to really tap into her talent. So no one can sort of slip into the cracks, fade into the woodwork, so to speak, and be just one more person in a large school or one more statistics. There's no statistics at Montrose. And thirdly, education of the heart. You know, the um, if you read what a lot of the psychological studies are saying about young people and young adults in the 21st century, they're very concerned about people having a lack of moorings, a lack of family, a, a sense of friendship. There's, a, there's this sort of emptiness. Um, people are successful. People are making a lot of money. People are achieving the goals they want, but they're not anchored. They're not committed. They don't um, have a place where they can really hang their their hat, so to speak. And um, it's really sort of a problem of, of uh, looking for love in all the wrong places. It's sort of the problem of, of heart. And when you look at some of the problems, challenges of relationships of young people, there really are challenges of the heart, of, of not knowing how to love well. And um, education and heart at, at Montrose has little to do with sex education or talk about dating and marriage as much as it has to do with helping young women learn to throw themselves into what they're doing academically, into their friendships, learning to develop a relationship with God that opens their heart wider to relationships in which they can serve within their families, their communities, and in their professional work. And the proof is in the pudding and that the the, the alumni of our school, many of whom I'm in touch with from my previous teaching there, and also many of whom uh, who've been back to the school to visit and advise me in my transition as head of school, um, they are not just to have fond memories of a high school experience and a few good friends. These are young women who not only become lead consultants in top firms, but they're the moral anchor among their colleagues when we've seen this really thorny professional and ethical conflict in their workplaces. Two of our alum have founded elementary schools based on the principles of a Montrose education. Others have pursued academic work in, in science and are really using that data and research to affect social change. And many others have dedicated themselves to raising their families and finding an educational experience for their children, whatever their community in, that embraces this education of heart, mind, and will, truth, freedom, and love. And I think going back to where I began um, with the suburban school, the independent school experience, the life in the bubble, uh, if we look at a number of the the scandals, if we, whether it's the scandal in the church, whether it's the scandal in corporate America, if we look at the egregious infractions of intellectual honesty in, in academia that gets lots of coverage, most of these individuals have been educated in independent private prep schools. Many of them come from suburban middle class, upper middle class backgrounds. And the what schools can provide, schools with a mission in any setting, but particularly in, in a setting that, and if you're interested in going into education in, in the, um, at the secondary level, I would urge you to challenge your students to see their responsibility to exercise both leadership and service, to develop their minds and their character, and to really cultivate faith and reason in tandem. So thank you very much for your time. I look forward to our conversation. Thank you, Karen. I think the way we can handle this maybe is if you have a question for a specific person that you address it to them, or if it's an open question to any of the panelists, we can see who would like to take it on first. Yes. about why Trinity decided to um, educate from an ecumenical point of view rather than a specific faith. Um, and if it was just, yeah. it was mainly because it was founded on people with faith and that financially people with praise or if there was another reason. Uh, the connection with the people with praise is, is the main connection there. As I say, we saw it as the people with praise. We were to do education from our vantage point. And we thought that we as a community 
had to fall to be ecumenical because of something that God asked us to do as a community and to try to witness to the unity, such as it is, among Christians in the school as we do in the community. Just to broaden that, we don't separate the students for our motto is what we hold together in common, we teach together in common. And what we don't hold together in common, we don't teach. So, for example, if you're in an eighth grade New Testament course and we come up to the Last Supper, the instructor will not say, and so Jesus here institutes the Eucharist and the priesthood. But he might say, or she might say, that Catholics believe this, Lutherans believe that, Protestants believe that. So we do separate them in the ninth grade, however, for a Catholic doctrine course, which we use for a number of encyclicals in the Catholic Catechism, and we separate the Protestant doctrine course, which is largely the history of the formation of the creeds and the history of the Reformation. But it was a founding principle that came, I would say, largely from the vision of the people of Christ. Thank you. 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 Th
be mindful of that and check in with that student and try to accommodate on some level. So that's what we do. But it, it's, it is a, a pastoral concern, you know, because it, Catholic with a small c is all embracing. But we are who we are, and this is also what we're teaching. And we have many parents from different faith backgrounds who were educated in Catholic schools, so they want that kind of experience for their students. I think that's pretty complete. The only thing I would add is that the philosophy actually is a very nice component to the theology program because it is reason-based. So it's accessible to all of the students. And it also allows the Catholic students to acquire the terminology and the way to explain things that is not always faith-based. And so they can, they, it broadens their ability to go to the roots of what, what they hold to be true, why they hold, to, to hold those truths, and then how to explain that to other people. So I think it's a nice mix with the theology uh, department, also including components of philosophy. to the distraction of having boys in the classroom. But on the other hand, um, I think especially in like a seminar setting, it the male perspective adds a lot to the conversation. And so I, I was wondering if you thought that was important or um, what your thoughts on that one. Um, see, at Trinity, you will have the uh, boys and girls in the, in the uh, colloquia in the senior year, right? That's true. Um, in the regular humane letters seminars, we don't. Uh, we've done it occasionally. I mean, we'll bring them together maybe for a book or for some particular reason. It's not like a big rule, and you can't have boys or girls together in the classroom. Um, but my, I would say pedagogically, as a, as, a, as a teacher, my experience is that they really can really, in general, do go uh, better when they're a single-sex situation. Let me give you an example from my experience. Um, I, I've taught boys' classes, and I've taught girls' classes over the years. And um, the, uh, I was at, at our school at Meadowview in uh, Falls Church, and I was teaching um, a scripture course there, ninth graders. And because the school was small, all our classes were mixed. Um, but you can't afford to have, and it's also not very good to have a seminar with five people in one or three or something like that. So you keep them together. <coughs> and uh, so this was a mixed class. This was a terrific class of, of students. And there was not a lot of boy girl distraction. And most of these, these students had known each other for years. In fact, one boy and one girl were, were blood brother and sister. I mean, it, it was, it was, and, and the, the, uh, those ninth grade girls thought most of those ninth grade boys were pretty immature. They were very interested in them anyway. And uh, they were immature. <laughs> so it, it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of, you know, male, female, stuff going on in the class. And it was a nice class to teach. They were good students, worked hard. But, it, and it's a similar, it's a very interactive type seminar class. I'm at the board, but I'm talking with the students and we're back and forth and all that. And as I'm doing that, it, 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 day in, day out, it seems it's not going anywhere. I mean, it's happening, but it's not going anywhere. And there's this little voice in the back of my mind saying, you know, if you could just get all the girls together, this would take off. Or if you could just take all the guys together, this would take off. And, and I think that's right. I mean, my, I think there's a kind of chemistry, uh, kind of unspoken. It's, it's, I don't know what it is. lies behind the scene. That's not about flirting or sexual impropriety or anything. There's just a difference between men and women and boys and girls, especially at those ages. I think maybe, you know, what we get to the junior, senior year, maybe we want to bring more of them together. And that's, that's certainly an option, I think. But I think it does work really. There's a there's something really dynamic that happens uh, to to those students in those settings. That in my experience, uh, when we put them together at a younger age, uh, you can you can just feel the situation in the classroom deflate. But that I mean that's just an opinion. I, mean, I don't have any mm -hmm. hardcore research on that. Our experiences our experiences have worked really well. Would it would it could you make it work in the mixed setting? Sure, that's another way to do it. And, and, I, and, I, and I don't think there's any reason not to do it, except our experiences, for us, this works best and has worked best for us. And it can build a lot of confidence. I mean, it just gives young women and young men who, men who might be inhibited by some of their peers more freedom to cultivate their ideas. And I think that's really the main principle behind it. And my hope for our students is that they 
will be in seminars with men, either in a model UN experience or outside of the school or when they graduate and go to the university. It's not as if the ideal is you'll, you can only enjoy intellectual exchange among women, but it, it, it's that building their confidence, helping them to take their intellectual lives very seriously, tapping their voices, um, which can only, you know, which studies tend to show that some women will always rise in a co-ed setting and some will not, and same for boys. Um, from, I guess, uh, uh, from, a, from, a, from a boy's <coughs> perspective, from a male perspective, um, in, in our seminars, there, you've got a lot on the table. You're, you're out there arguing, making your point, and, uh, and it's competitive. I mean, uh, there's not, it's not just, uh, you know, people uh, desiring knowledge for its own sake, but there's some, I'm going to win this argument, you know, going on too. And uh, the, uh, when it comes to boys and girls in a seminar, at least in the younger ages, um, uh, boys do not, let's see, boys do not like to, to uh, lose to women uh, publicly. And uh, they stand a big chance in a seminar. Uh, the girls in high school are usually a lot better students. They read more carefully, and they got the detail. They may not have the big picture, but they got the detail. And what will happen to a guy in that setting is a typical boy will get into it, he'll get in an argument, and he'll lose a few times publicly, and he'll never join it again. He's, and he'll say, school is women's work. And he's going to go play soccer, or he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna find his maleness in some other way. But he's, he's, he's going to be treated from this style. He's not going to get shown up by some girl publicly. So, I mean, it's a, it's, that's a bad thing. I mean, they got to grow out of that. You know, they do. But it's, it's, it's really true, the dynamics between the sexes. <laughs> yeah. I had a question just about the Trinity schools and to what extent you incorporate more modern texts with or along by Yeah, that's, a, that's a very good question um, Most of the modern stuff we do is largely actually the poetry stuff that we, and we, we just revised our poetry readings to include a lot more modern stuff We talk about it a lot you know. We talk about uh, doing uh, Dorothy and philosophy and doing more uh, American pragmatists, we talk about reading Mills on Liberty, uh, and um, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a it, it, the fact that we haven't done it is a mix of, of two things. One is just uh, uh, lack of momentum. I mean, we can talk about it, and when it comes to doing it, we haven't gone ahead and done it. The second thing is it's always a question of what you're going to take out of the readings, what you're going to replace. So, so we have a big interest in doing it, let me just put it that way, and we will Somebody would take leadership here, maybe I should, and uh, lead the charge to get it done. I think I'll let back to you. Um, I, this is a question for Dr. Collar. I'm, I'm really interested in your grading system. I think it's absolutely fantastic, but I'm wondering how it transfers when applying to university for your students. What we, uh, what we did um, about two, three, four years ago, we had, we had a long, for a long time, uh, we always had a grade. I mean, so I wouldn't put a, a grade on that certificate, but I put a grade in my grade. <coughs> and there's a grade that comes out, goes on a transcript, and it has to be defended. I mean, you have to be able to say, this, and, and, and we tell our faculty, you know, this is not silly. This has to be. This has to be the real grade, and you have to pay. You have to be able to show why that student got that grade. Um, but what we did find actually was that our students over the years. Uh, we're having difficulty in college admissions. We often had to uh, talk to the college admissions office because our, our grading was, was, there was no grade inflation. I mean, this was really tough grading. And so our students were, were I mean, everybody was forced to take calculus, was forced to take Latin, was, you know, if you will. They didn't have an elective, and they've got courses that, they're, that are very tough, and they may not be very good at, and they're getting graded very toughly on it, so they suffer in the college admissions process. So about three years ago, we went online and got all the SAT stats. We, have, we do real well on SATs. And we, we found our students in a national, on the national profile were way up at the top of the SATs, but the, the grading, the grade, the GPAs they were getting from us were nowhere near what the, the national sample was getting. And that also looks bad. It makes them look like they're, they're overachievers on the SAT. And, and not, you know. So we changed our grading scale much more to reflect the national average of grading. So our students are coming in now, we, we think, uh, in, in the feedback we're getting at, on, on an even playing field. Um, I have a question for all of you about sports that was occasioned by your comment about the gym. Because I know I am, I'm from <coughs> Detroit Catholic uh, schools, high schools, 
But the school down the street, Country Day, made everybody play a sport. It doesn't matter how good you were at it. And I'm wondering, do you have any kind of sports requirements or do you encourage your students to take that up? Is there enough space, enough facilities, or is this a major problem that you face? Quickly, we encourage everybody to play. We have a number of teams. We have a no-cut policy if you go out and come to practices during your playing time. That's not true in the upper high school in Minneapolis because they play in the state league and they have other rules about how many people you can carry on the roster. The school in Minneapolis is very competitive. The girls' soccer team has played in the Metro for the state championship. They are very, very good. Other schools have not come up to that level yet, but they're trying. It's always a stretch for any school in terms of finances, for gymnasium, playing spaces, fields. That's very expensive, and everybody works very hard to find enough. We'll have sports. I come from San Diego High School in Cleveland, which certainly had the sports, that's for sure. But this is a little different because on any given day, one quarter of your team will be at work. They won't be at practice. So the emphasis is very, very different. You know, in looking for a school building in Cleveland, we basically were looking at old school buildings, school buildings that were going to be closed or were already closed and so forth. So ones that were built in the teens and 20s and 30s. And very interesting, they had very little sports facility. Maybe they had a gym, which was also a cafeteria, which was also a theater. One had a balcony of the theater over the gym floor, so you couldn't take a three-pointer from one side of the gym. I don't know whether that's a home, depending on your shooting, what the band says. But I found that interesting. Very little fields. I mean, you know, there were parks nearby. And it made me start to think about the emphasis of sports. I liked the St. Ignatius where we had built a gym, which was an intramural gym, which could not be used by a team. And it was open all the time. And the sign was built by a guy named Murphy, Murphy's Law. Everybody plays. So I like that idea. I think it's fun. I think kids, adolescents, boys and girls love to, you know, get the physical exercise and so forth and do that stuff. Most do. Some don't. But I wouldn't require it. I think there are some people who just don't want to do it. It's not their interest. So I don't think there's a underlying, I don't believe in, you know, the playing fields of Eaton routine and so forth. I don't believe in that. I think sports can be destructive. And I've seen it be destructive. But if it's on an intramural CYO type level, I think it's fun. And I think it should be encouraged. Most of our students play sports. I mean, we're meat and potato schools. We don't have an official size gym. We have no playing fields. So practice and games, everyone's got to get into a van. The big deal this year was we had 50 new students and the coaches had a crisis. We don't have enough uniforms. We don't have enough seats in the van. How are we going to accommodate? They didn't want to cut junior varsity because it was an opportunity for the students to really make friends and have a lot of fun. I mean, because the focus on sports is learning the skill, developing friendship, teamwork, leadership. So athletics is very important. It's a common choice for most students, but it is an option. You can do drama. You can commit yourself to yearbook. And they do really well. The Bad News Bears team, without their supplies, they do really well. Okay, I think we have time for maybe two more questions. I'm wondering, ma'am, in the school, Mr. Ryan there, how you can not only admit students of other faiths, but promote them reading the Koran or praying to a false god? We don't encourage them to pray to a false god. We allow them to worship, or there's no real opportunity for worship. We allow them to pray with the texts that are part of their tradition. If that is part of what helps them to pray. And it's based on a really strong conviction that we will share everything about Catholicism with you. We will pray with and for you. But we cannot undermine your freedom. We cannot coerce. We have to respect freedom of religion, freedom of faith. Now, if we had a student 
who is trying to claim that satanic worship was her religion of choice, we would have something very clear to say about that. Because that's not a religion that is helping a human being walk towards the truth. And I think our school very much appreciates the idea that grace builds on nature, that faith builds on reason, that faith is a gift, and that grace is a gift. But we need to respect them as human beings, educate them as well as we can intellectually, culturally, love them so that they will see, they will receive that gift freely and nurture it. So we definitely would not allow pagan worship. That would be really contrary to our culture as a school. We're not advocating constant use of other religious texts. We're just being mindful that you don't necessarily have to pray the rosary or sit in front of the Blessed Sacrament and believe that this is really God truly present. But you're welcome there, and we encourage you to come there. But if you want to use these sacred texts, there's a reflection of the truth in them. I think that's what this Holy Father, John Paul II, has so much wisdom and insight in that so many world religions have, everyone has a piece of the truth. And so that's basically the way we see it. Okay, final question. I have a question. I have just been excited listening to all of the ways that you guys do things, and I think they're great. I was just also thinking, like, instead of, with all these great ideas and great ways of doing things that are obviously effective and obviously really important, are there ways that you guys are taking action to help, like, public schools who aren't thinking about this? I mean, like, I really agree that you're creating your own schools and doing that, but at the same time, I wonder, like, these are important things that public schools and public teachers need to always be learning and seeing how effective they are and trying to incorporate them even in the public schools, even if it's not, like, their focus and their, you know, maybe not as a school. Like, they, I don't know, I just wonder if you're taking any steps to reach to the other teachers and other programs. We've been engaged with a lot of charter school stuff. We've licensed our curriculum to a charter school in Arizona, which right now is getting all the top scores in the state. We were approached to partner up with a national charter school corporation. We decided, our board decided not to do that because we could not teach Christ. That is to say that we were not, we didn't think our call was to become, be involved as a school in terms of the fundamentals of what we do in public education, whether it be Christian education. But nonetheless, I served on the board of a charter school here in town. I'm on a national review panel for charter school grants from the Walton Family Foundation. So we are trying to be engaged at that interface where we can and where people want to have a discussion. Well, we can be of service. We try. We're, we actually are in a position right now to learn from the public schools around us in terms of how to approach our students. And most of the students in the whole Cristo Rey Network situation come from public schools. So there is cooperation. You know, my sister for 30 years or more, 40 now I think, has taught in public schools. So we've had this family debate every time we come home together. And I think we're all at the same thing. Now, clearly the religious aspect is different. And so that's different. But there's a lot of similarity. And the public teachers, the public school teachers that I've met, including my sister, but particularly in Cleveland, are excited about this idea because it's another way and another chance for this kid to succeed, to get out of this mess that he's in or she's in. So I think we're all in it together. I know that the Paul Vallis, who was the superintendent of schools in Chicago until I think he ran unsuccessfully for governor, was at the Cristo Rey school dedication and clearly stated that we are doing this together. 
So that's kind of the attitude of the whole network, and particularly the school in Cleveland is we're doing this with each other. Let's share as share we can. And certainly we've had tremendous cooperation with the public grade schools who have noticed kids and said, look at this kid, look at this kid. So they've been kind of promoting kids to us, which is nice. Yeah, it's so important because all teachers recognize the dignity of their work. That's what keeps them in teaching, whether they're in a large public school or a small public school or a private school. For the past nine years, my work has been primarily with public school teachers in a variety of different public school settings. I would say the only – there's a huge hunger. We provide professional development seminars in the summertime. There's a huge hunger for ways to educate the whole person. It's very important, too, that public school teachers realize that to take the complete education of their students seriously doesn't mean they have to be – they have to demonize religion or be phobic about their own religious life or practice. Sometimes people are very confused about separation of church and state. The point is you cannot proselytize in a public school classroom. But to encourage students to tap the sources of wisdom that animate their personal lives, their moral lives, that being their religious background, that's a great thing. That's a liberating thing. But most of my work and what I see Montrose doing down the road is serving the greater – the wider educational community of parents because we have so much for parents – for our own parents, seminars on adolescence, on parental leadership, but to provide that to a wider audience and also to provide support in networking with other teachers because, I mean, everyone cares about their teaching and reaching their students better. So I don't think we're exclusionary anyway. Okay, I think we have to end now and we can give a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you.